Grammar Girl here. Tonight is Thanksgiving in the United States, so I have a tidbit about the pilgrims who came to America on the Mayflower, and a meaty middle about how to pronounce foreign words, since all of us except Native Americans are descendants of people who were once foreigners in this land. But first, a message from our sponsor. This holiday season, Sock Club is delivering the perfect gift experience. Quality American-made socks are sent straight to your loved one's door, featuring different designs and a personal note every month. This is the gift that keeps giving all year long. And I have to say, the socks are cute and the packaging is even cuter. A lot of companies talk about delighting their customers. Sock Club really delighted me. The packages feel like a fun gift every time I get one. So go to SockClub.com and get 15% off using the discount code GRAMMAR at checkout and give Sock Club this holiday season. And now, on to some interesting pilgrim names and stories. When I was writing the thousands of sentences in my iOS game, Grammar Pop, I wanted to include as many different names as possible, so I looked at old names, new names, spelling bee winner names, lists of popular names in as many countries as I could think of, and one short list I ended up finding was a list of all the American pilgrims' names. And I was struck by how unusual, symbolic, and hopeful many of the names were. For example, Remember Allerton was a little girl of about five when the Mayflower set sail. Remember, that's such an interesting name. Humility Cooper. Humility was a passenger on the Mayflower who came with her aunt and uncle when she was just one year old. Desire Minter was a young woman who came over on the Mayflower. She was probably younger than 19. And both desire and humility later returned to England, which wasn't common. Degory Priest was an adult hatter, about 40 years old, who came alone on the Mayflower, planning to bring his family over later. Unfortunately, he died the first winter at Plymouth. About 40% of the passengers died that first hard winter. Oceanus Hopkins was a baby boy born while the Mayflower was at sea, And his name isn't much of a mystery. He was born at sea, and his name comes from the Latin word for ocean. Damaris Hopkins was Oceanus's two-year-old older sister. Historians believe the Damaris who was on the Mayflower died, but then the parents had another daughter and named her Damaris, too. Resolved White and Peregrine White were two young brothers on the Mayflower. Resolved was five at the time of the voyage, and like Oceanus, Peregrine was born on the ship. He was born while the Mayflower was anchored in Cape Cod Harbor. His name, Peregrine, comes from the Latin word for pilgrim. Finally, it's hard to choose, but I think these two are my favorites. Wrestling Brewster and Love Brewster were two young brothers from Leiden, Holland, who came over with their parents. About 40% of the pilgrims on the Mayflower were religious separatists who had moved from England to Leiden hoping to find a better life. But it wasn't working out, so some of them decided to make the dangerous journey to America. Wrestling was six years old when the Mayflower set sail, and Love was nine. Wrestling likely died, but Love lived long enough to serve in a militia under Miles Standish, Mary, and have four children, one of whom he named Wrestling, after his brother. The poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who wrote Paul Revere's Ride and the Song of Hiawatha, is one of Love Brewster's many descendants. I didn't use most of these names in Grammar Pop because names like Wrestling and Love would have been confusing in sentences because they're words and don't sound to us like names anymore. But I thought it was fascinating that the pilgrims seemed to give their children such symbolic and mostly hopeful names. And I got most of this information from MayflowerHistory.com. Before we get to our meaty middle, it's time to tell you about our second sponsor, Blurb. If you're looking for that perfect holiday gift, Blurb can help because the ultimate gift is one that keeps on giving. Blurb's free bookmaking platform allows you to create customized, professional-quality photo books for loved ones right from your computer, iPhone, or iPad. You can make thoughtful, one-of-a-kind gifts that won't be forgotten. For example, you can make family photo books— 
books of a friend's Instagram photos, and more. You could turn your favorite mouth-watering family recipes into a cookbook the whole family can enjoy, or make a travel book to relive all the memorable moments from this year's epic vacation. You can print one copy, or many, if you want to give that cookbook or travel book to everyone in your family. Free layout tools make the process easy, and experts are available to help every step of the way. If you want to create a unique custom gift this holiday, go to blurb.com slash grammar and enter the code grammar for 25% off. That's blurb.com slash grammar and the code grammar at checkout for 25% off. Blurb. Make a book. Leave your mark. Next, this meaty middle about foreign words has been in the works since July, and I've been waiting for the right time to run it, and last week it occurred to me that Thanksgiving would make sense because it's when we think about the pilgrims, who were some of the first foreigners to make lasting settlements in what became the United States. And I have a feeling the history is actually more complicated than that, but maybe our Unknown History podcast can clear that up for me someday. But today, we're going to talk about words and pronunciation. What is different about words like bread, desk, and sword compared to words like burrito, bureau, and karaoke? If you said that the second set of words comes from other languages, you were right. The process is called borrowing, and it happens when one language adds a word or sometimes a short sound sequence from another language into its own lexicon, and that means word collection or inventory in a language, lexicon. Linguists also call these words loan words, although both terms are pretty funny because we certainly don't give them back. All languages borrow words from other languages. This process is part of the larger category of phenomenon called language contact. The more bilingual people there are in an area, that is, the more contact between two languages in one spot, the more likely one language is to borrow from the other, although that's not the only way it happens. So how do loan words get pronounced? Well, this is where things get tricky and interesting. Let's look at these three words, tortilla, armadillo, and guillotine. We pronounce the two L's in tortilla like a Y, as they are in Spanish. Yet in armadillo, we pronounce them like an L, Now let's consider guillotine from French. Most English speakers pronounce the two L's like a Y, as it is in French, too. But not all English speakers pronounce it that way. This spectrum of pronunciation patterns is called assimilation. Because English doesn't usually pronounce L's like Y's, the word armadillo, we could say, has been fully assimilated into English because we pronounce the L's like L's. This could be because it's been around long enough for spelling to have influenced how speakers pronounce it. But what is assimilation exactly? Well, in order to be used, loanwords must fit the phonological rules of the borrowing language, since a lot of the time the original words contain sounds that the borrowing language doesn't have. Since a lot of the time the original words contain sounds that the borrowing language doesn't have, So speakers automatically alter the words so they can say them. All native speakers unconsciously follow these rules. For example, in English, we don't cluster consonants V and L, so when we try, we stick a little space between them, out of necessity, and often without perceiving it, like the way we may pronounce the Croatian name Vlasic Pickles like Vlasic. But in Croatian and other languages, such as Russian, that combination is common, so the speakers effortlessly blend the two sounds. Some speakers of Asian languages that don't have an L sound may replace the L in foreign words with an R, a sound they do have, and one that falls into the same phonological category, so it makes sense as a substitute. This is just like the way English speakers often replace a Spanish rolled R with an English R. These substitutions aren't random or illogical. They're systematic and governed by rules. These rules, or restrictions, are called phonotactic constraints. 
What's really interesting and more complicated is that because word borrowing is a process, there are often long stretches in which the loanwords are pronounced differently in different speech communities. Here's a fun example. Most of us in the U.S. say filet a lot like French, without pronouncing the T. However, in Australia, the word is fully assimilated into Australian English. They say fillet. Plus, you most likely have heard or will hear English speakers in some U.S. areas say tortilla with that L sound, too. These variations across speech communities are possible when the words contain sounds that occur in both languages. For example, we say the French loanword cliché fairly close to the original, cliché. We're able to do this because we have a similar K sound, L sound, E sound, SH sound, and A sound in English. Yet we still alter the sounds slightly, and as a result the word doesn't sound like a French speaker is saying it. Here's an interesting side note. While that filet pronunciation may sound funny to many of us, most people would agree that the collection of dialects in Australia are fairly socially prestigious, meaning English there isn't unfairly stigmatized worldwide, and so people aren't likely to accuse Australians of ignorant pronunciations, something that unfortunately does get assigned to more stigmatized language varieties. Language and dialect prestige, or lack thereof, refers to the bias and stigma that people assign to ways of speaking that are associated with sociological characteristics, such as the financial or educational success of the speakers or the country. Studies about the interaction between society, culture, and language fall in the realm of sociolinguistics. Even within one single speech community, there are sometimes variations. For example, while many people say the name of the French cathedral like Notre Dame, others say something more like Notre Dame, which is closer to the French it came from. Whether or not loanwords are adapted from the borrowing language or kept more as-is depends on a variety of factors. One factor is how much people in the borrowing country hear native speakers of the lending language. Another factor is how much the sounds overlap. A third factor is how often the speech community uses the borrowed word. Yet another factor is the prestige of the lending language. Some studies show that speakers try to keep the original pronunciation more if the language is viewed as socially prestigious. Finally, the longer a loanword has been borrowed, the more likely it is to be assimilated, or at least to have one agreed-upon pronunciation. For example, alcohol is technically a loanword, but it's been around so long that we all say it the same way now. Why are people sensitive about how we pronounce loanwords? Some people mock speakers for pronouncing loanwords using the speech patterns of the borrowing language. And other people mock speakers for pronouncing loanwords in the donor language accent. We just can't win. Let's talk about that first type first. Unfortunately, it's very common for people to criticize speakers for pronouncing loanwords the way that the borrowing language requires. For example, people might make fun of you if you pronounce the L's in tortilla. However, there are, of course, many reasons to avoid mocking speakers for using their own accent for foreign words like that. For example, it's important to remember that while you may speak the lending language, such as French or Spanish, fluently, or well enough to pronounce some words correctly, others haven't had such exposure, or the privilege of education, or of learning and being exposed to other languages. Speakers are usually just pronouncing the words as they've always heard them. Also, think of how impossible it can be for speakers to pronounce sounds from foreign languages we don't know at all. Plus, if you happen to be using a borrowed word from a language you're familiar with, that works out great, but languages borrow from hundreds of other languages, so there's no way to make everyone able to pronounce all sounds around the world. Further, as blogger Linguistic explains, Brain studies show that sometimes speakers aren't even able to perceive certain foreign sounds that they don't have in their native language, let alone produce them when pronouncing a loanword. 
So it's best not to accuse people of butchering a language they don't know, especially when they're doing the best they can and speaking the way that they know. Now let's talk about the second way of pronouncing loanwords that people are sensitive about. Honoring, so to speak, the original pronunciation. How should bilingual folks pronounce loanwords when they're fluent speakers of both languages? Bilingual anchor person Vanessa Ruiz was criticized last year for pronouncing Spanish words with a Spanish accent. You can read more about the story on Linguish Dick's blog, and I'll put a link in the transcript. In some ways, it seems unfair, or at least unkind, to criticize bilingual people for speaking as they normally would in their own language. When you hear people pronounce foreign words correctly, they may be doing it because they're engaging in an automatic act of code switching, a language phenomenon that occurs largely unconsciously and usually when the speaker knows that the listener is also bilingual. What may have been off-putting to some about Ruiz is the fact that the code switching felt less natural on live TV because perhaps only half of her audience speaks Spanish. On the other hand, it could really only be labeled a communication problem if the audience members who speak only English couldn't understand what she meant, and that probably wasn't an issue. Rolling R's in Spanish words doesn't really prevent English speakers from getting the message. Another possibility is that people reacted to her in anger because they feel envious of people who are bilingual, even though they may not be fully aware of it. Especially in the U.S., where learning a foreign language often isn't required in schools, being fully fluent in a second language is pretty rare. Another possibility, according to Linguistic, is that people who do or do not pronounce Spanish words in Spanish ways may be expressing certain subtle political views about immigration and cultural assimilation, which can definitely get folks riled up. So what about when we learn a new language and speak it to native speakers who don't know English? How should we pronounce their English loanwords? That's an interesting question. A good rule of thumb is, when you're speaking a foreign language, make your best effort to pronounce the English words the way they do. Mostly because if you switch back into English accent patterns for English loanwords, hamburger is one common example, your listeners may not understand you. This applies to proper nouns and proper names, too, not just loanwords. Some people feel it's important to pronounce their own names as they truly sound in their own language, but that may not always work out well. For example, because French has no H sound, many French speakers pronounce Hannah like Anna, no matter how much the Hannahs may try to insist otherwise. You could also find a compromise like keeping the vowels and consonants that both languages share, but adapting the missing ones or maybe adjusting syllable stress to a more natural pattern for the language you're speaking. The neat thing about this is that sometimes people will switch to a foreign accent to say a name, like Alice as Alice in French, even when speaking in English, but only when the speaker knows that the other person speaks French too or has met the francophone Alice in question. This is also a form of code switching. Here's a funny story about a certain linguist who spent a year in France during college. She found herself following along pretty well, but then would hit a snag when French people spoke American names in a fully French accent, like this. Sarah Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker. Or... Elton Jean. Elton John. When she stared, baffled, they would say, how could you not know who we're talking about? He or she is so famous. So these pronunciations make sense for French people to communicate naturally with each other. It's a bit like the way we say Paris in English with the S at the end. It's a proper noun that we use so much that it's officially an English word, even though it's spelled the same in both languages. So this linguist learned that if she pronounced those English celebrities' names with a thick French pronunciation, the way they did, she was understood much faster. In conclusion, here are some suggestions. Pronounce foreign words like you hear others do in your speech community. Don't criticize people who pronounce foreign words like their own native language requires. Don't criticize people who pronounce them like the foreign language. 
If you'd like to pronounce the foreign word in its original way, think about the people with whom you are speaking. Did they speak that language or know how to say those words the original way too? And finally, if you're traveling and speaking or learning to speak a foreign language there, try pronouncing English loanwords and names their way. The locals probably won't even notice and they may understand you a lot faster. That segment was written by Sayel Graves, who has two master's degrees in linguistics. You can read more about her at sayelgraves.com. That's S-Y-E-L-L-E-G-R-A-V-E-S dot com. Thanks to everyone who told me where they listen this week. Elizabeth listens while walking her fluffy white dog. Kelly listens while getting ready for work in Glendale, California. Marcus listens from Georgia State University. Brian has been listening since way back in 2007 when he was deployed in Iraq. And Mrs. Becker listens from Ross School in Marin County, California. And I love this part. She says her daughter also listens from afar, and they enjoy having it as a common interest. Thanks, everyone. Finally, here's a reminder. The ebook version of my book, The Grammar Devotional, is still on sale for only $1.99. So pick up a copy today. That's The Grammar Devotional. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening. And if you're in the United States, I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. 